Hello guys, welcome to lesson number 117 and for this one I wanted to start by showing you these positions and try to pause the video as always and see what you do next if you were playing this in a tournament game. For all, as you can see, it is a white pieces to move. Notice that in the first one, we're putting a lot of pressure in our opponent's territory, but also our king is not that safe, uh, so we have to consider that as well. So take as long as you need and try to come up with a plan, try to come up with your continuation. Now, after we go over these three positions, I'm going to show you a game that I played myself. Let me see if I have it over here. And I'm going to show you how I was able to defeat a 2400 the Master using what we're going to talk about in this lesson. So with that said, let's get started with the first one. And I'm assuming, guys, that you actually put in the work. And even if you don't get the answer, like we have talked about before in this course, if you, don't, if you didn't get the right continuation, the fact that you try to visualize, to calculate, is going to help you a lot. Now, one more thing that I wanted to say before we continue. Guys, first, this new setup, if you missed our very first live stream, go back. Uh, I'm leaving the link in the description for you to see it. And since it went well with that, I just kept it for these lessons as well for the main uh, playlist of the beginner to master level course. Now, the other thing that I wanted to say is that when you're doing your tactics at home, if you're using a book or anything, you're using a chessboard or this uh, analysis boards online, try to look at the position that you're about to work on and try to reproduce it on the board. For example, if I'm doing that now, I'm going to remove all of the pieces and I'm going to look at the position that I have on the book or anywhere that I'm getting the tactics from. And I'm going to try to recreate it on the board. So I remember the king was over here. Uh, my queen was doing a battery somewhere here. That was a bishop on b3. That was a rook on a1. And even if you don't get them all correct, this exercise is going to help you a lot with your visualization of the board and everything else. So just something for you to do. I know that a lot of my students are doing it and they tell me, oh, it's actually doing wonders for me. So just give it a try, see if you find it as useful. Now, let me just put this back, that way we don't waste time. And let's take a look at this position. Now, a lot of you guys, I'm sure, you were looking at moves like rook takes rook, followed by queen a8 and things like that. And it's normal. I, I was expecting you to consider those candidate moves. However, the main thing in this um, in this lesson is about converting your games. If you know that, if you see a, a, an edge, if you see something that could give you a better end game, for example, well, go for it. Many times, many times we are in these positions that are so aggressive, we have so much control, and we're only focused on checkmating the king. Well, in this case, we could walk into an end game, guys. Because if you pay attention to this, we have talked about it a few times. We have two pawns versus one on the queen side. And this is a side that is far away from the kings. So that could give us a pass pawn and that pass pawn could give us the game. So candidate moves is going to be again taking the rook because that's a check, but also queen takes f7 is a check. Now, if we go deeper into queen takes f7, we know that they cannot take with the rook because it's pinned. They cannot take with the king because the bishop is behind it. So the only move that they have is taking with the queen. So that I'm liking already because it's forced. So after queen f7, queen f7, I want to see if I could simplify the entire game. I already got this pawn. So if I'm able to remove all of the pieces, queens, bishops, and rooks, I'm going to be left with a pawn and king endgame where I have two versus two over here. Then they get a pass pawn. Don't forget, this guy's gone, guys. And... Even though they have this pass pawn, I'm going to create a pass pawn on this side. And my pawn is going to be the outside pass pawn. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you guys have to go back to our end games lessons. But anyways, we're going to go into it right now at this point. So anyways, queen takes, queen takes. Now, at this point, I need to be careful how I capture again. I need to make sure that every single move is a check on the king. So here, if I go ahead, check. He cannot take with the rook. Again, that rook is going to be pinned. He needs to take with the bishop. Check. And just like that, I liquidated the whole thing. So this is how you convert this game easily, effortlessly, from that middle game into this end game. Now, I'm going to show you how you could continue with this end game. But before we do that, guys, very important. If some of you are thinking, you know what, I feel more comfortable with my queen on the board and so on, well, just know that this queen is also on the board and it could get you in trouble. There's so many things here that could go wrong with so many pieces. Also, when we did this move, if we had done rook takes first 
and he takes. Now it's not the same because when you take the queen, it is not check. So he could easily remove the bishop and now it's kings, pawns and bishops and it is not going to be as simple as the kings and pawns endgame. So going back here, um, we said that we want to do it with a check. So check, then check, and then we take only three. Now guys, from this moment on, all you need to do is bring the king over, of course, we know that he's going to do the same thing. And then you're going to create a pass pawn with these two. Once you have that pass pawn, this king has to go after it. And in the meantime, your king gets this one. By the time you get their pawn, they get your pass pawn. You're going to be closer to these guys. So just to show you, let's say something like this. And guys, I know maybe these are not the best moves, but let's say we get this far. And if the king goes over, I'm not even concerned. That king cannot even get close to my pawns. So let's say he goes, I don't know, back in here. Now, I need to be careful how I create the pass pawn. If I did something like this, it could complicate things because then this is one pawn that stops two pawns. So maybe you want to go something like, I don't know, c3. Let's say if they do something like this, well, we stop it. No big deal. Now, look, this is the simplest way. Not the simplest, but, uh, well, yeah, the most risk-free uh, way to get the pass pawn. So no, no risk of being stopped or anything like that. So let's say we get to this position. I finally got my pass pawn, takes, takes, and then he goes king c5. Well, I take, by the time he takes my pawn, my king is the closest to collecting this pawn and then this pawn and so on. So notice how we went from this position, guys, to this end game where we're clearly winning, if, of course, if we know end games. Okay, so next position, here we are. Notice that this is already an end game, but still, we could, if we understand, if we have been following this course, we should know how easily convert this from this endgame with two minor pieces that could be tricky. We will know how to convert it into a very easy endgame. First things first, we gotta pay attention to the pawn structure. Notice that, it, notice that it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, we both have an isolated pawn on the queen side. Um, we have four, four pawns on the king side. We both have a knight and a bishop. So when we have these minor pieces, we have to pay attention to what minor piece is a good minor piece, which one is a bad one, and the possible trades that I could do. Ideally, I want to leave my good minor piece versus his bad minor piece. And don't forget, it's not so much about what you capture, it is about what's left on the board. So in this position, the easiest way to continue is to leave our knight versus their bishop. Notice how their bishop is very defensive, it is blocked by their own pawns, so that's the piece that I want them to keep. And in this case, we have a very nice continuation to make sure that that bishop is never improved. At least it is going to take them some time to improve that bishop. So the continuation is eliminating our bishop. Notice how our bishop is also blocked uh, blocked now, but we have these pawns in the center, the same color as a bishop, and compared to the knight, it is not so good. So we eliminate that knight, the pawn takes, and that's the first stage. At this point, our knight, for sure, is controlling that bishop. It is on the better square, and more importantly, it cannot be kicked out by the bishop. Now, after we take the knight and they take back, the next step is to make sure the bishop is not improved. How? Well, if this pawn is, is moved, then the bishop has more scope. So what we do is pawn to e5, and that's it. The bishop is going to be buried on c8, and eventually you could even do pawn to b4, and that's going to be the end of it. Like if they did something like this, then you could go pawn to b4, notice how all of these are on dark, dark squares, and the bishop just cannot do anything. Now, guys, something like f6, we could even do f4. And again, we're going to have a better end game. This is going, this is going to be very comfortable for you to play against anyone. And look, even if you, let's say you, you play this, like we've said, try to finish it against the engine. And if you cannot finish it, well, at least I'm confident you're not going to lose this. Like, it's very hard to have your opponent, even if this is the best person, uh, player in the world, it's hard for them to come back from this. This bishop is basically not playing at all. So it's important for us to understand these little details, these little positional advantages, and work on them to convert your games. If you're playing in a, in a tournament game or any games, and especially if you're in time pressure, and you don't take care of these things, you let your opponent have counterplay to have active pieces, you're going to get in trouble. So always be in the lookout for things like this. All right, so last position before we go into the game that I want to show you. Um, in this position, guys, this is the white pieces. As you can see, the white pieces are in a better position. Notice how the minor piece that they have is better than their opponent's minor piece. The knight is not even developed. Same thing for the rooks. My rook is putting pressure on that pawn that is left behind. 
it is on a semi-open file, the rook is not even developed, and then the only active piece that they have is the queen. And of course, our queen is also pretty active. So two things that probably came to mind when you looked at this position. Number one, can I just get closer, try to attack that king since they are behind in development? Or the other thing would have been, can I convert this by simply going into the end game? Well, a lot of my students, guys, what I do for the first part of their training is to get really good at attacking the king. So when I show them something like this, even without thinking about it, they're just focused on that king, how do I put it in checkmate? Well, eventually I take them away from that and we talk more about uh, this more positional uh, strategic detail. So in this game, the right continuation, what they did in this game was queen to h4. And the idea is to remove the only defender of that pawn, the only active piece that they have with taking it away. And I know, I know that we're getting uh, double pawns, but that doesn't matter. Soon we're going to get this pawn, the other pawn. This is just going to be a way better end game. Now, in this game, of course, the black pieces did not go for it. They did queen to d7, but then we have queen to d8. We're forcing them to finally trade that queen. And then, guys, after knight to d7, they're, they're happy that they finally got uh, the knight developed. Well, after bishop c7, the pawn is going to fall. And I know that a lot of you guys are thinking of, oh, you know what, this is just a pawn. Well, there are more than one factor here to make this easy for us. Number one, we got the pawn. Number two, look at this, doubled isolated pawns. And finally, we know that the bishop is going to be better than the knight in this end game. Now, if that's not enough, look at this. We also know from lesson number 74, guys, that bishop and rook are a better combination than knight and rook. And finally, we have this pawn priority on the queen side, three versus two. We know from the other exercise that this is going to allow us to get a pass pawn. And you know what, guys? This is actually a very good end game to finish against the engine, to finish against a friend, and see if you can put this in practice. Now, don't forget, activate your king, try to little by little, continue to put pressure on the weak pawns, of course, and little by little, see if you can do something on the queen side. Now, there's not much for you, for you to do on the king side, but you can definitely put pressure with your rook. Maybe the rook could eventually get to the seventh rank and then see from there if you could capitalize on this position. All right, so the last thing that I wanted to do, let's put all of that, let's see it in practice, actually not put it, let's see it in practice. And I wanted to show you guys this game that I saved it. I think this was like for from a few weeks ago where I'm playing this opponent of mine and let me just go all the way back. And you're going to see that I started with knight to f3, pawn to e6, and I'm doing something that you're more than familiar with. I'm doing my uh, ready opening, if you, if you want to call it like that. But I'm thinking of maybe getting into the King's Indian attack or the pieces with white pieces or King's Indian defense. Well, my opponent is doing this interesting setup, uh, knight f6. And notice that I'm not going to go too deep into the opening details because I'm more focused on that conversion from a superior position in the late middle game to a one end game. Now at this point I did d4, notice that we typically do um, pawn to d3 and the idea is that we want to stay in our elements. But here I said, you know what, let me just put the pawn on d4, then pawn to c3. Notice that I did not do pawn to c4, which is uh, customary in these positions. I just went to c3, more solid, then bishop g5 and knight to e4. Of course, he's just allowing me to trade the bishops and I'm going for it. Then he takes, then knight e5, placing my knight on, in the center. But of course, this is not a weak square. They could easily kick me back. And of course, they did. They don't want my knight there for too long. So I had to put it back. And I put it on the three guys because I like this pin on his knight. I don't think I can take advantage of it, but it's nice to have that. Right now, it's just a pin. In the future, I might be able to do something with it. So he went knight d7, f3, just like my knight was not on a weak square. His knight is not on a weak square because I have pawns that could take care of that knight. So I just went pawn to f3, knight f6. Now I claim the center and he goes pawn to e5. Not a big deal. If he takes, I'm going to replace it with another pawn, so not a big deal. I went knight to d2, finishing my development, and then d5. Now, these guys, when I see this kind of tension in the center, I know anything that we do next is going to dictate, is going to change the, the character of the game. So I decided to just take on e5. So knight takes, then he takes, I take back. And when the queen takes, I decided to push, since the pawn is protected, I'm pushing that queen, um, they move back, and now pawn to e5. Now, for starters, if you look at these pawns on the, on the king side, and actually almost all of my pawns are 
on dark squares, which is a good complement to my light square bishop. If my pawns are like that, this bishop is going to be better and better. Look at this, all of this scope. But also, since I don't have a dark square bishop, well, my pawns are controlling the dark squares. So that's something to keep in mind. And, and again, I don't want to get too much into detail at this point, but uh, maybe you find that useful. So anyways, 94 now, and this is my opportunity, guys, to get an edge. When, he, when I see this knight on e4, immediately I took, he took back, and now this pawn, in my mind, this is a weak pawn, something that I can put pressure on. So immediately I put pressure on the target, so queen e2, and of course, getting away from the open file. I don't want them to put a rook there at the expense of my queen. So I'm putting pressure on the pawn, they go pawn to a5, and now I need to make a decision. Do I want to keep my protected pass pawn, but of course I have to allow them to also have a protected pass pawn, or do I do a passant? And I just get into this position where they have to take back, and I leave them with an isolated pawn. Now, from this moment on, guys, uh, or at this point, we have to visualize. If we cannot calculate and visualize that result, it's hard for us to make a decision. But if you visualize this, if you visualize maybe bringing the rook over, and you compare, then you should be able to make the right decision. And to me, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it was better to leave them with that isolated pawn. Now, why am I showing you this? Because from this moment on, the entire game, guys, revolves around me converting this game based on the pawn structure. So I know that if I collect that pawn, imagine if that pawn is taken, I'm going to be left with three versus two on the on the king side and this pawn majority on the king side in my mind it is going to help me get a pass pawn and with that pass pawn i should be able to win the game now let's see uh, let me show you how it finished um, at this point of course I'm, i start putting more pressure on the pawn they do the same thing and now let me bring the other rook this rook is doing nothing i need to bring it over so c5 now guys one thing i don't like about my position is that the first uh, the first piece in that battery here is my queen. Ideally, my queen would be the first one in line. So what I did was get away from that with a check. So I'm winning a tempo there. Then they moved, and now I put my rook first one in line. So rook e6. Notice how all of their pieces, and we talked about this, I think, lesson 102, where we talked about uh, what to do when your opponent has an isolated queen's pawn. I know it's not the same, but you could apply some of the principles, like making sure that his pieces are tied up to the defense of that weakness. So after that move, of course, I double up my rooks. Now all of my pieces are also putting pressure on that pawn. So from this moment on, you're gonna see h6, and I just went bishop h3. So my bishop is starting to make them uncomfortable. They had to move the rook, and now I would like you guys to pause the video and think of what you do next. Take a few seconds, a few minutes, it doesn't matter. Pretend this is your game in a tournament. What would you do next? Well, in my mind, guys, I'm thinking, I want to go back to use my bishop to put pressure on that pawn. I don't have any other piece that could do that for me. But I also don't want them to get back on e6 to protect it. So I could do bishop g2. When I show this to my students, they tell me, oh, what about f5? And the rook cannot go back to e6 in the future. Well, all of those moves are valid. But even better, guys, is to just bring the bishop to f5, I hit the pawn again, and I control e6. And that's exactly what happened here. At this point, there's nothing they could do. And since my opponent realized this, he's going to start doing something. He needs to at least play energetically. So he attacks my queen. I need to get away from the threat, but I need to continue to keep an eye on that pawn. So I went queen a4. Now he's doing the same thing over here. And finally, queen to c2. There's no more attack on my queen, and my queen continues to keep an eye on that pawn. So now I have one, two, three, four, and they only have one, two, and three, nothing they could do. So they decide to just let go of it. So queen f7, hitting the pawn, not a big deal. So I take, they take, and this is great for me, guys, because not only am I getting the pawn, I'm simplifying a lot. I'm getting to that end game. Now, from at this point, they cannot even take on a2, because this is going to be already devastating for them. Don't forget my queen is controlling h7. So instead, we got king g8. Now, b3, I do not want to give them any edge. I don't want them to get the pawn. I want to keep my pawns. And the only thing left for me to do is to actually trade the rooks and the queens. If that's done, then this is a very simple kings and pawns endgame. Guys, if you cannot imagine the, this position without these pieces, 
And if you cannot see how this result in Kings and Pawns Endgames is easy to win, then again, you have to go back to the basics Kings and Pawns Endgames. We have had a few lessons on this. Uh, if you have no idea about what this is, you're going to move up the ladder only up to a certain point. Endgames are extremely important. They're boring, but they are extremely important. So at this point, um, my opponent went queen d5, queen e2, keeping my pieces active, coordinated, and now queen d1. Well, this is music to my ears. I want to trade pieces, and now the king goes towards the center. Endgame, we know the king is going to be active. Now, king, f king f7, c4, king f6, g4, very important. No counter play for my opponent. I don't want him to get to my territory at any point. So by doing this move, these pawns next to each other, they create this barrier, and the black king is at margin. So g4, a5, rook e2. I'm planning to bring my king over, but I don't want him to get back here on the on the seventh rank. So instead, um, after rook e2, he goes a4, h4, he takes, I take. Notice that by the time I take back, my pawn chain, the base, is not on a2 anymore. So the seventh rank is not, or the second rank, it's not a big deal now. Uh, it's going to be more of the third rank. So my opponent goes rook d3, not a big deal. Rook e3 takes care of that, check, I go up, and now I'm ready to come over and help. However, after rook h4, I said, let me go back. No counterplay for my opponent, guys. This is the key word, no counterplay. So he goes back over here to b2, my king comes over, he keeps putting pressure. He's happy with repeat, repeating the moves, but I cannot afford to draw this game. So h5, he goes back to b2, nothing for them to do, and my king comes over. What am I looking for? Well, trying to get to the queen side. Well, he's coming back here, not letting me. I put my rook in the way, happy to trade rooks. If he did that, then extremely easy for me to, to win this. But check, I go back to f3. I know, I mentioned that I wanted to go over to the queen side. But guys, I just don't want, again, any counterplay. Instead, what I did was go back to f3 and now rook e6. So he knows. I'm going to go to d6 and collect the pawn. So he needs to be now passive, and this is my opportunity to push forward. I took care, look, all of these moves, I'm just being there careful, prophylactic, I don't wanna give him anything. Now, he gives me the edge, his pieces are passive, I need to start playing energetically. So rook d5, cutting his king off, and supporting this g5. Look, pawn majority, I need to put it in motion. If I don't use my pawn majority, it's like I don't have it, so I need to use that. But I just didn't want to get ahead of myself. So now, g5, he goes back, my king gets active. So pawn majority plus king activity plus rook activity is just too much. But we gotta be patient, guys. So he goes here, check, pawn majority in motion, check. Now I take, and by the time we take here, guys, finally, I got my pass pawn. This is going to be my win in this game. Now, this should be enough if we get to trade the rooks even easier. So. The rook goes back to d5. Now my king is finding the way in. King e5 finally. Now check again my pass pawn in motion. King e6. And now at this point, something that <laughs> something that was not necessary, but I was looking for simpli sim but I was looking for simplicity. I was looking for a way to convert this game. And the way I did it, guys, was by sacrificing my pass pawn. Now I could have done so many things here, even something like um, rook d6. And there's sort of like in the Sux one here, and I'm even going to get that, right? Well, I decided to do f7 because now I calculated if the rook takes, I'm going to go rook d8, give him my rook up, but now I get his rook. So I went from rooks and pawns endgame into a kings and pawns endgames where my king is extremely active when compared to his king. So all I'm thinking now is bringing my king over to take, and I got a pass pawn. Oh, I got a pass pawn. So after all of this happens, Notice how he's trying to put me in, in, in sort of like a stalemate or smothered my king so that I cannot get out. Well, we danced around for a little bit and then finally I just did h6. He needs to move and I get out. Now guys, from this moment on, there are two main plans. I know this is so basic and simple, but you have to know it by heart. Now, I could do one of two things. Leave this pawn as a bait and simply go over. And actually, I think this is what happened in the game. Yeah, so he had to take, by the time he gets the pawn, I'm just too close to the other pawns. I took, I promoted, and I'm just going to show you this, just in case. Then I did a tempo with the pawn, I get to uh, c7, I promote, 
and this is an inaccuracy there on my end time pressure and checkmate at the end right now what is the other plan that we could have done let me go back just for a tiny bit here and here instead of going away and leaving this as a bait you could have done this plan check he gets in here and now we put it in stalemate position why because he still has pawns to move and this is a more elegant approach but it is riskier so with my students I show it to them, but I always tell them, go with the safest, which is the other one that I did. Now, if they did this, you take. The thing to keep in mind is that when they push the other one, you cannot take, guys. If you take, that's going to be stalemate. So you got to keep pushing, keep pushing. And now here, you could even get a rook, and that's going to be checkmate. Now, I was showing this to a student of mine, and he's extremely talented. Uh, he told me, you know what? What if instead of getting a rook or a queen, what if we get a bishop? And that makes sense. Even if this guy gets a queen now, we're going to go bishop e5 with checkmate. So this is, you see, there, there's always room for getting creative in this in this end game. So anyways, guys, I wanted to show you this position mainly for you to see how we went from this moment where I took, the, uh, I created this weakness, this target for my pieces. And then look, this is move number 18 and the game lasted 87, 88 moves. So this is 70 moves just working around that weak pawn and then we took it isolated pawn and we knew from move number 20 we knew that we wanted to go for these kings and pawns end games where the uh the pawn majority was going to give me an end game like this one oh, actually let me go all the way back it was gonna give me an end game with something like this this is the past pawn that i had in mind from before so guys i'm going to leave it here feel free to go back to these positions and Put them against the engine and see if you can finish them all uh, little by little. It's just good training. Also, don't forget that hint about looking at the puzzle that you're about to work on and try to recreate it on the board. It's going to help you a lot. So with that said, I'll see you guys in our live stream. Uh, I'm doing it on Thursdays. I know we did one last Thursday. We're going to do another one the following Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. So with that said, if you like this lesson, let me know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe. So until next time.